You're in for a treat in this episode. Author and translator Dave Brunn joins us to talk about many translation issues that you've probably never thought about. His book, One Bible, Many Versions, is now my favorite book to point people to in order to understand the true issues behind our English Bible versions. He helps cut through the marketing rhetoric and provide a view of the objective reality of translation. This will be the first of two parts, and you're not going to want to miss it. Get ready to be surprised, learn a lot, and be reminded of some important things. I'm Andrew Case, and you're listening to Working for the Word. is an Ethnos 360 missionary, translator, and educator who spent over 20 years in Papua New Guinea with his wife, Nancy. Currently, they live in Camdenton, Montana, where Dave serves as a translation instructor and an international Bible translation consultant. He and Nancy have helped hundreds of students in the U.S., Canada, and Australia prepare for missionary service among remote people groups across the globe. Now, we're going to talk a lot about content that is in Dave's book, and there's a lot more in his book, One Bible, Many Versions, published by InterVarsity Press. It's a super readable and informative book on translation, which is for everyone, including pastors, Bible students, missionaries, translators, Bible study leaders, or anyone involved in Christian ministry. I personally can't recommend it highly enough. He has produced a truly valuable resource that represents years of detailed, hard work. So let's jump into this interview and begin by hearing more about Dave. My wife and I had the privilege of serving for over 20 years in Papua New Guinea in the South Pacific, and it's a country that has many, many languages, over 800 languages. It's estimated around 830 languages in Papua New Guinea, and uh, the country itself only has like seven or eight million people, which means it has one one thousandth of the world's population, but it's estimated that it has perhaps one twelfth of the world's languages. So it's, it's incredibly diverse linguistically. And we had the privilege of learning one of those languages to full fluency. We, we built a home out in the jungle and we lived with these people and uh, learned their language, learned their culture. And we were involved in doing church planting and Bible translation among the, the Lamogai people of Papua New Guinea. And we were a team of missionaries. My main role on the team was primary translator. That doesn't mean I translate. Of course, in, I'm constantly working with the mother tongue speakers. They're the experts in the language. I'm supposed to be the expert in exegesis, in biblical exegesis. That doesn't mean that I'm a, an expert. I have had training in that, of course, but uh, I can surround myself with experts. We have many, many references available to us. And so as I started into translation, I was committed to translating as as faithfully and as accurately as I possibly could. And uh, the further I got into the process, I started to realize that it, it wasn't really quite what I had envisioned it before I started translating. And we would come home on furlough every four or five years, and we'd be in North America, of course, in various churches and various other contexts, and I would hear people discussing translation, sometimes even arguing about translation, and it was clear to me that most of those arguments about Bible translation, about the various English versions, really were not necessary because they weren't based on a a true, complete understanding of what translation really is. Uh, They're often based on an oversimplified view of an incredibly complex process. Now, when, when translation theorists talk about all the different Bible versions that we have in English, and of course, we have more Bible versions in English than any other language on, on earth. Many languages only have one, like Lamogai, but English has countless Bible versions. And Translation theorists will often place each Bible version at a specific point on a continuum that they have have drawn that would go from more literal to less literal. So some of them would be over on the more literal side, 
And they often call that modified literal, and that's because there's no such thing as a truly literal version. There, there are always modifications. And then it would go to the less literal, which, which is often called the idiomatic side. And if you get too far in either direction, then that's where it's really not acceptable. It can become unduly free on the idiomatic side, or it could be highly literal to where it really is not communicating clearly, even to, to us as uh, native English speakers. And as I, was, as I was translating, I mentioned that I was committed to translating as faithfully and as accurately as I could. But I encountered some surprises along the way. And now, it wasn't surprising to me that some versions translated more literally and some translated less literally. But as I would approach a passage to, to translate it with the, the translation team, with the, the team of Lamogai translators, to translate it into the Lamogai language, I would look to see what the source text said. And I would compare that with several different English versions. And that's where I really started to encounter some surprises because I saw that some of the very most literal versions often used what I would call classic dynamic equivalence translation principles. And I'm not saying this uh, to put down any of those versions. I think they're excellent versions. For example, the New American Standard Bible has right on their title page, uh, it, they call their version the most literal. And in some sense, it is. Uh, there's the English Standard Version, which leans to the literal side. Uh, the King James, the New King James, lean over to the literal side. And then you have several versions that are more on the idiomatic side, like the New International Version. It's, it's a little bit closer to the middle, but then the, the New Living Translation is quite a bit, quite far on the, on the idiomatic side. But as I compared the various versions, I found that it wasn't just the idiomatic versions that would choose idiomatic renderings, I found that even the most literal versions, the New American Standard and the ESV and the King James, uh, often would leave their target area and they would choose renderings that were deep in idiomatic territory. In my book, I give many, many examples. I have, I have uh, over 100 charts and diagrams, and my, my uh, intent is not that anyone would pore over those charts and necessarily read every single example, but sometimes it's the sheer volume of information or examples that can be impactful. The fact that in many, many, many cases, the literal versions have used what I would call classic dynamic equivalence translation principles. Just a few examples in, uh, in Job 27.7, where uh, the source text basically says, he who rises up against me the New American Standard Bible translated that as my opponent. And I think that's perfectly appropriate, but it is definitely a simplification. It's, a, it's an interpretation. It is a dynamic equivalent rendering. Or in Job 31.18, the source text says, from my mother's womb, and the NASB translated that from infancy. Or they translated sons of tumult from Jeremiah 48.45 as riotous revelers is not crowned in the source text in Greek in 2 Timothy 2.5, is rendered does not win the prize in the NASB. All of these are appropriate renderings, but they're certainly not literal. Of course, the English Standard Version does the same thing. Every one of them do. All of the literal versions, the versions that we think of as literal, will often choose non-literal renderings. And I'm not talking about when they are just backed into a corner linguistically and there is absolutely no option. There are many, many cases where they have chosen to go with a non-literal rendering or a non-literal translation of a particular phrase or verse, even though a quite literal rendering is available. I think this is perfectly appropriate, and I don't think that, uh, that the translators of these versions are out of bounds. I don't think they're being deceptive at all, uh, but I do think that some of the perceptions that English-speaking Bible readers have about many of these versions is not totally accurate. Uh, for example, in Mark 9, 3, the source text says, no cloth refiner on earth, where it's talking about making this cloth extremely white and bright. And uh, the ESV left that part of the meaning out. They said, no one on earth. And they left the the verb to carry that meaning. Or, for example, in Galatians 1.16, where Paul said, I did not consult with flesh and blood, 
the ESV said, I did not consult with anyone. Again, a perfectly appropriate rendering. Paul wasn't specifically talking about flesh and about blood. That's a a figure of speech that he was using that really talks about any human being. Now, as I was comparing the various versions, it was surprising to me to see how often the literal versions chose non-literal renderings, but then it was even more surprising to me when I found how often the notably non-literal versions actually end up being more literal than the versions that we think of as being literal. For example, in Psalm 44:14, a fairly literal rendering from the source text would be shaking of the head. And the New International Version and the New Living Translation both went with a fairly literal rendering, shake their heads. But in this particular verse, the English Standard Version and also the New American Standard both translated it as laughing stock. There's, they didn't include anything about the literal words shaking of the head. Again, it's a perfectly appropriate rendering, but it's certainly not literal. And in, in, So in this particular case, and in a surprising number of other cases, the New International Version and the New Living Translation are both more literal than either the ESV or the NASB. Another instance is in Psalm 69, 14, where the source text wording basically says, those who hate me, and that's exactly what the New International Version and the New Living Translation went with. The ESV translated it, my enemies, and the NASB translated it, my foes. Uh, Again, perfectly appropriate renderings, but certainly not literal, and it's not that they could not have translated literally. They could have if they had wanted to, because the, the NIV and the New Living did, but those two chose not to. So there are some cases where the literal versions end up over on the idiomatic side of the continuum, and the non-literal versions end up on the literal side. Again, if you look at if you look at the book, uh, especially in chapter one, there are many there are charts with many examples. And so as I was translating, it was surprising to me that I saw that the the seemingly literal versions in English are not nearly as literal as I had previously thought. And that is one of the main premises of the book, is that the literal versions are not nearly as literal as perhaps a lot of people think. Uh, that, that's not, again, to cast any aspersions on them, but uh, they're, just, they're just not as literal as people think. And basically, every dynamic equivalence translation principle that someone might condemn in a non-literal version, if they prefer not to read non-literal versions, I could show you places where their favorite literal version does exactly the same thing. They won't do it as, as frequently or as consistently, but basically every dynamic equivalence translation principle is across the board. It can be found across the board in all of the, all of the different versions. And then another thing that really stood out to me as I was translating, is some of the litmus tests of faithful and accurate translation are they're really based on English, and they're they're impossible in the Lamogai language. So if if some of those preferences of how to translate faithfully and accurately, if those are really God's standards, then that means the Lamogai language is automatically disqualified from having a faithful or accurate translation because a lot of those standards they just don't carry across into the Lamogai language and many other languages. Now, let me just say, one of my favorite things about your book is the amount of charts and lists of examples that you give, because that is what makes it so valuable and really bringing this home. And so thank you for taking the time to put all that together. It's been really helpful. Well, once I started to dig into it, I just I just couldn't stop. Um, <laughs> you know, and I, I just... Uh, I, I sifted through literally thousands of footnotes in some of the literal versions to find places where they acknowledged that they didn't go with the most literal rendering that they could have. Wow. I'm just curious, since the publication of the book, have you had any of these major translation translators, like Board of the NIV or ESV, contact you? Well, I have had the privilege of meeting with many of the major translators Many of the primary translators of of all of the major versions, uh, including okay. the NIV and the New Living and the 
the NASB, the ESV. Actually, some people might be surprised to know that that some of the translation teams for, for example, the NASB and the New Living, some or the you, sometimes you have some of the very same people involved in translating a highly literal translation and a highly idiomatic translation. They just they just approach it with a different set of parameters. But some of the people that are that are perhaps uh, some of the 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 most qualified living experts on a particular book of the Bible, they will be sought by publishers of both literal and idiomatic versions. And as I've I've met these people and uh, looked at all the lists of the translators, that was a little bit surprising to me too. Hmm, excellent. That's really interesting. There's a lot of discussion about form and meaning. And of course, the more literal versions will, will attempt to reflect more of the forms of the source text. Every version reflects to some degree some of the forms, but other versions, the idiomatic versions, are not as concerned with reflecting the forms. But we have to keep in mind that when we translate, translation by its very definition is a change of form. It means changing from the form of one language to the form of another language. Even the Hebrew and Greek letters themselves are part of the form of the source text. And of course, if we retained the Hebrew and Greek letters, then we would not have have translated at all. And mm-hmm. what I'm saying here, that's not to say that the form of the of the source text is unimportant. It was specifically chosen by God as the means of conveying his word to us, but we have to keep in mind that it's impossible to truly transfer the form of any one language into another language. It will break down at some point. We can we can have right. a, an approximation, but we're not going to be able to, to really transfer the form straight across. So there are two essential elements of translation. In order for translation to take place, the meaning must remain the same. If the meaning changes, we haven't really translated. But the second thing that must happen is the form must change, at least to some degree. That doesn't mean that we get rid of all appearances of the form, but the form has to change to some degree or another. We're, we're going from the source text form to the form of the receptor language or the target language. And translation theorists often use a model that I've included several at several different places in my book. It's generally thought of as a meaning-based translation model where the, where the translator starts with the source language text, digs beneath the surface to discover the meaning, and then re-expresses that meaning in appropriate target language or receptor language forms and that's called meaning-based translation now in response to the to the rise in popularity of meaning-based translation the term and and talking about dynamic equivalence the term formal equivalence was coined and presumably that would be skipping the step of digging beneath the surface to discover the meaning and just go straight from the form to the form but if you really compare the source text with any of our English versions, even the most literal ones, you'll see that that is not the model that they followed. They did not go straight from form to form. They all dug beneath the surface to discover the meaning and re-expressed it in other forms. That's a really good point and very helpfully expressed, yeah. You know, when we, when we talk about changing the form from one language to another, I find that one of the best places to start is with idioms and figures of speech. Because anyone who has even a little bit of exposure to another language other than their than their native language knows that if you try to translate idioms and figures of speech straight across from one language to the next, you're going to create some problems. Mm-hmm. In most cases, idioms and figures of speech do not carry across to other languages unless the languages are very closely related. Uh, for example, an example that, that I like to use is, uh, in English, we talk about someone as being warm-hearted. And we know what that means. That means they're kind and compassionate. Now, we could translate warm-hearted straight across into the Lamogai language, antoineingil. That reflects the form of warm-hearted. But there's a problem, because antoineingil is, is a phrase that they use in Lamogai. But in Lamogai, warm-hearted means angry. It doesn't mean kind and compassionate. So if I literally translate the form of that idiom, have I been a faithful translator 
or not. Well, clearly, I've I've changed the meaning. I've corrupted the the meaning of the message. Another related term is cold-hearted, which we know in English means ruthless or cruel. Again, this can be translated literally into Lamogai, antoinevris. It, but unsurprisingly, it's just the opposite of warm-hearted. It means he's not angry anymore. He's cooled off. He's placated. <laughs> so if I say cold-hearted for someone who is placated and appeased, have I been a faithful translator? Well, no, I haven't. It's a totally different meaning. And a third related figure of speech is hard-hearted, which we know in English means stubborn and unteachable. And I could translate that straight across into Lama Guy too. It would probably come out something like Antoine Namor. But this creates a different problem. If I said Antoine Namor, they would be like, okay, what does that mean? Because it's just not something that they say. It's basically meaningless to them. Instead yeah. of saying his heart is hard, they would say his ears are closed. And I can tell you that all the, all the ways, all the different places where we would talk about hardness of heart, someone being stubborn, unteachable, it carries straight across. It's the way that they would use their phrase, weinekauk, which means his ears are closed. It's, it's very clear with idioms that translating the form is going to, in many, many cases, change the meaning. And if the form can be retained and reflected to a certain degree without changing the meaning, that's okay. But any time we have to make a decision, are we going to reflect the form of the source text or are we going to reflect the meaning? If reflecting the form of the source text is going to change the meaning, then we will not reflect the form in that case. And there are hundreds of instances where the translators, even of our most literal versions, chose not to literally reflect idioms or figures of speech. And in chapter 2, there are some charts there of both uh, Hebrew figures of speech and Greek ones, and many of them the average reader has never heard of because no English version attempted to translate them literally. In some cases, some versions translated them literally and others didn't. But uh, the translators of every version understand that you have to be very careful with idioms and figures of speech. And I think we all understand that. That's why I like to start with idioms and figures of speech when I'm talking about reflecting, giving priority to meaning over form. Of course, it, it doesn't only relate to idioms and figures of speech. If you study the various versions and compare them with the source texts, you'll see that the translators of every literal version have done the same thing in all areas of of language, not only with idioms and figures of speech. Now, one thing that I like to, to um, bring out when I talk about this is the principle of ideal versus real. Every Bible version in the preface or introduction to their version, they outline what their translation goals are, and that's the ideal. But what we have to realize is they don't always follow their ideals. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that they're doing something wrong, but they have a target. In fact, you have to, it's important to have a target, have a general area that you're aiming for, but you realize that there are going to be exceptions, and there may be many exceptions. The ideal, of course, in any situation, if we step outside of, of just Bible translation, uh, if we think, say, culturally, the ideal is what a person should do, and the real is what a person actually does. And of course, the, more, the most significant areas as we're analyzing ideal versus real is where the two do not line up. So for example, we might say that an ideal is, as a Christian, I'm a picture for all the world to see, showing what God is like, loving and kind, quick to forgive, eager to extend grace to those who don't deserve it. That's the ideal. Okay, what about the real? Well, we could each fill that in for ourselves. I mean, Hopefully there are times that we are a picture of what God is like, but I think there are times that probably for each one of us that maybe we're not a very good picture. And this relates to translation as well. So for example, the, the example that I gave you from Psalm 4414, the ESV and NASB would aim generally for the literal side of the translation continuum. They would generally look for a rendering over on the literal side. But in this particular verse... They did not translate it, shake their heads. The NIV and the NLT, that's the New International and the New Living, both opted for a literal rendering, shake their heads. 
but the ESV and the NASB in this particular case jumped way over to the other side, deep into idiomatic territory, and translated it as laughingstock, which is, of course, very much a thought-for-thought interpretation. It's not a word-for-word rendering at all. It's a it's a thought-for-thought interpretation. Every version frequently uses thought-for-thought interpretations. Now, one problem that I've found with some of the discussions Even some of the articles and books that have been written about all the various Bible translations in English is often they focus almost exclusively on the ideal. They're just talking about the, the goals of this particular version and the goals of that particular version. And sometimes they will even cherry pick examples that they give verses that support the ideal, Mm -hmm. that fit into the ideal. So often when they're talking about a literal version, they will only show places where the literal version is translated literally. When they're explaining what a non-literal version, like the New Living does, they will only use examples where they are non-literal. But if we're really going to be objective and fair, I think we should use both kinds of examples for both kinds of translation. So for so it's important to to demonstrate that there are places where even though the ESV and NASB generally aim for the literal side, there are places like Psalm 44, 14, where they changed shaking of the head to laughing stock. And in this case, where the NIV and the New Living decided to go with a more literal rendering. Uh, if, I, if I mentioned the two different renderings, shake their heads and laughing stock, and listed the four versions, most readers would probably assume that the ESV and NASB were the literal ones, and the NIV and the New Living were the non-literal, but, and that's how it is, of course, more often throughout Scripture, but in this particular verse, and also in many other examples, it's the other way around. So, I don't want to undermine anyone's confidence in any of these versions. Uh, I think, I think every serious Bible reader should have a copy of every one of the versions that I have mentioned so far, plus many, many others as well. I think you should own and regularly use all of these versions. So again, I don't want to undermine your confidence in them, but I do want to shine some light on the truth of what these versions really are. Because if your confidence is perhaps in the thought that the NASB and the ESV are going to show you, give a transparent view to the words of the source text, well, sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. You can't really tell if this particular verse is translated literally in any of these versions without going back to the source text itself. Mm-hmm. So, you know, one, there's a lot of, of focus specifically on words, translating words. And something we have to keep in mind, and I think we probably realize this, especially anyone who has studied another language, is that most words do not carry straight across from one language into another in every context. We, we should really think of it more as partial overlap rather than word-for-word correspondence. For example, if I asked any of you, what does the word agape mean? I'm sure just about all of you would say, well, it means love. Okay, and that's the most common way to define it and to translate it, but it's not the only way to define it or translate it. It's translated other ways as well. Or, for example, if I asked you, what does the, the Greek word charis mean? Most of you would say, well, that means grace. And that's true. That Again, that is that is the, the most common way to define it and to translate it, but it's not the only way. So it's not totally accurate to say charis equals grace. There is partial overlap between those. There are places where the word charis is used, and it's not going to be translated grace. In the, the King James Version, for example, use it, translates it using the verbs sometimes, like thank or thanked. Uh, adjectives such as acceptable, gracious, thankworthy, and several other nouns besides grace. Sometimes the word charis in the King James is translated benefit, favor, gift, thanks, pleasure, liberality, and joy. And this sundry assortment of vaguely related English words is not going to give a transparent view of the, the Greek word charis. It's not going to be immediately evident to most readers, that the word in Greek for these particular verses is charis. Another word that that we might, that I think is fairly interesting, is the word logos. Uh, Again, if I would ask any of you, what does the word logos mean? I think most of you would say, well, it means word. 
right? And yes, that's true, as long as we keep in mind the fact that, that it's partial overlap. There is partial overlap between the Greek word logos and the English word word. Uh, the King James translates logos 24 different ways. Account, cause, communication, doctrine, fame, intent, matter, and several others. Tidings, treatise, utterance. So sometimes it's word, but sometimes it's translated a different way. And other literal versions will translate it several of these 24 ways, along with other ways too. If we take just the King James, the ESV, and the NASB together, those three collectively translate the Greek word logos more than 50 different ways. So what does logos mean? Does it mean word? Well, sometimes it does, but it means about 50 other things too. And, and again, uh, there, if you look up all the different places where Logos is used in Scripture, you would be surprised where it's hiding, in, sometimes in places where you wouldn't expect to find it. One passage that we often look at when we talk about the words of Scripture is Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. And in the NASB, that reads, I testify to everyone who hears the words, that's a form of the word Logos, the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words, logos, of the book of prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. And uh, this is a solemn warning that every translator needs to take to heart, but we need to understand what it really means. It is not saying that we need to try to translate word by word by word and have each Greek word just be equivalent to a single English word or a single word in another language. None of the versions have tried to do that. Um, there, there are actually a few places where some versions leave the word logos untranslated. So, uh, for example, in the King James Version, I'm not, I'm not picking on the King James. It's an, it's an excellent version in its day. Um, it still is an excellent version. There are some parts of it that are hard for a lot of English speakers to understand today, but it was translated very faithfully and very accurately. But, for example, in Matthew 25, 19, the Greek basically says reckons words with them, using the term logos, but King James just translated it, reckoneth with them. They left out the word logos. The word logos, they left untranslated. This is not a textual issue. It's not that in some Greek manuscripts it's there and in some it's not. No, it's there in the Greek manuscript that the King James translated from, but they decided not to reflect the term logos. They just left it untranslated. Or in 1 Corinthians 15, 2, keep in memory what I preached unto you. Well, in Greek it actually says, hold fast what word I preached to you. Again, I'm not saying they left out any of the meaning, but uh, they did not reflect all the form of the words. And there are, there are other examples as well. If we look at this passage in Revelation 22, just these two verses, if we, if we were to, for example, do a word count, in the, the UBS Greek text has 65 Greek words, the Scrivener Greek text, which is an edition of the Textus Receptus on which the King James is based, uh, has 61 words. So there's only a four-word difference, and it, doesn't, it does not really alter the meaning of these two verses. And yet the various versions are all over the place in how many words they have. So, for example, the NIV has 65 words, which matches the number of words in the Greek text, but that doesn't mean they translated word for word. There are some words that were left untranslated and other words that they supplied that don't directly correspond to any Greek word. The NASB has 68 words. Uh, the Good News Bible has 70 words. Interestingly, the King James translation of these two verses has 81 words, and it's based on the Scrivener Greek text, which only has 61 words. So, if we wanted to criticize the King James, which I'm not doing, we could say, wow, they added 20 words to this solemn warning against adding to or taking away from the words of Scripture. I think that in itself shows us that's not what those verses are saying. It's not saying you have to have one word to one word correspondence. And anyone who's, who's learned another language knows that 
that one word to one word correspondence really is not practical. And it, it's, it's really not about word counts. Um, I'll, I'll just mention one more example of a word count, and that's in the first 16 verses of the New Testament. It's, it's a genealogy. It's Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 16. And if you count the words in the UBS Greek text, in these 16 verses, there are 246 words. Two, there are 248 in the Textus Receptus, only two words different, and it, it again, it does not change the meaning. But Interestingly, if you compare with some of the English versions, some of the literal English versions, the ESV used 299 English words to translate these 246 Greek words. So we could say, if it was all about a word count, which of course it's not, we could say, wow, the the ESV added 53 words to this passage, and the NASB added 48 words. But then the King James used 226 words to translate the 248 words that are in the in the Textus Receptus. So we could say, wow, the King James took away 22 words. And if you count the words in the New King James version of these 16 verses, it's 202 words, which we could say they took away 46 words. So from the ESV adding 53 words, all the way to the New King James Version, taking away 46 words, there is a 97-word disparity between the ESV and the New King James. They're they're translating the same exact, the same text, basically, only two words different between these two Greek manuscripts. They're translating the same text, and yet there's almost 100 words different in, in just the span of 16 verses. And interestingly, all four of these versions have been called word-for-word versions. And Andrew, that's one thing that you asked me to comment on is word-for-word versions. Honestly, I think that's, that's one of the most unfortunate terms that has been used to describe any Bible versions, um, English, English Bible versions in particular. And it's because it's misleading, and I'm not saying anyone is trying to mislead anyone, but I think for the average English-speaking Bible reader who does not have direct access to the Hebrew and Greek texts, when they hear the, the phrase word for word, they hear that term, they think of much closer correspondence than is actually reflected in any of our versions. I mean, if we're going to call a version word for word, we're going to have to make some some serious qualifications. For example, we're going to have to say that we could call two different versions word-for-word versions, the ESV and the New King James. They're both word-for-word versions. But by the way, in the first 16 verses of Matthew, there's almost 100 words more in the ESV than there are in the New King James, just in those 16 verses. Wasn't that so helpful and interesting? We're going to wrap it up here for the first part. Make sure that you're subscribed so you don't miss the second part of this conversation and interview. It's going to be just as interesting, if not more. Working for the Word is a podcast where we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists to help us all treasure the Bible more, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1.